<laughs> you organize the questions. That's what you need to do. And I'm the district. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته it's a, obviously we're a small group alhamdulillah but there's many listening at home I'm sure alhamdulillah we're gathered uh, to gain wisdom and to learn uh, knowledge inshallah from Dr. Hani he's just returned back from a trip to Bosnia and to Turkey mashallah he's been doing incredible work in Bosnia for the last since, since the since the crisis began over 30 years ago nearly 20 plus years ago so He's had more experience than any one of us. We're young people. We're, when we were young, or when we, before, probably even before we were born, the crisis in Bosnia started. And Dr. Hani was uh, carrying out emergency aid work, uh, val- invaluable aid work to the people of Bosnia, helping them, progressing them. And till this day, you can see the fruits of his, his work and his team's work in Bosnia, alhamdulillah. So without further ado, inshallah, I'd like to just uh, welcome Dr. Hani and thank him for accepting this invitation. And inshallah, just begin by asking him where did it all begin in Bosnia and what took you to Bosnia in the first place? I'll start with recitation of Quran. Inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. وسيق الذين اتقوا ربهم إلى الجنة زمرا حتى إذا جاءوها وفتحت أبوابها وانفتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها سلام عليكم طبتم وقال لهم خزنتها سلام عليكم طبتم فادخلوها خالدين وقالوا الحمد لله وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي صَدَقَنَا وَعَدَهُ وَأَوْرَثَنَا الْأَرْضِ وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي صَدَقَنَا وَعْدَهُ وَأَوْرَثَنَا الْأَرْضَ نَتَبَوَّأُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ نَتَبَوَّأُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ حَيْثُ نَشَاءُ نعم أجر العاملين وترى الملائكة حافين من حول العرش يسبحون بحمد ربهم يسبحون بحمد ربهم 
بهم وقضي بينهم بالحق وقضي بينهم بالحق وقيل الحمد لله رب العالمين صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله خير مولانا ميخائيل Very nice recitation. Reminds me of Sheikh Mustafa Ismail, Sheikh Sharabasi, Shaisha, Al Minshawi, Muhammad Rifat, and others. You have to keep it up because these are, and others, the masters of reciting the Quran. the word of wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, our meeting is about Bosnia, Srebrenica, then Turkey. Most of you were not born at the time when the massacre of Srebrenica happened in 1995. And most of you were not born at the time when the conflict in Bosnia happened in 1992. It was a plan for ethnic cleansing to the Muslim Bosnians from the ex-Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia before the division or the fall of Yugoslavia became Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia, Slovenia, Macedonia or Macedonia Uh, as well. So this, when Bosnia wanted to become an independent state like others, there was a war happened in the area. First, the war was between the Serb and uh, Slovene was very, very small, not short, uh, long, not long, short war, not, not long one. Then between the Serb and Croatia, Serb are the Orthodox, Croat are Catholic. Then after that became the bloody war between Serb and Bosnia at that time, which lasted for three years. During these three years, everybody thought that the war would be over in about three, four, five, six weeks because The Bosnian did not have army, did not have anything to defend themselves, and they were taken by surprise. But it took the first year, which is 1992, the year of shock. The second year, 1993, the year of recovery. And the third year, which is 1994, which is the year of coalition with Croatia to try to win the war. and the fifth year, which is the year of the massacre of Srebrenica. During this three or four years war, there was five areas, called them uh, enclaves, surrounded by Serb, Gorazda, Srebrenica, Sarajevo, Jiba, and Bihać. There was concentration camps, not different to what we have seen happening to our Jewish brothers and sisters at the time of the Second World War. There was organized rape when they used to take the young girls or young women. They locked them inside the camps for months and they have systematic rape five, six, seven times to the same girl every day. Then she became or they became pregnant and they release them when they are five or six months pregnant, so there's no way that they can have an abortion. So a lot of young babies have been born without knowing who was their father. Because during one day, the young girl or the young woman used to be raped more than five or six or four times a day. 
for these few months. I remember a story of Sister Adisa, which you can find her video with me on my Facebook. She was 17 in 1993 when she was captured by the Croat and put in one of these concentration camps. And she was raped, but she refused to stay inside the camp. And she decided to run. She is a very strong girl, maybe six, maybe nearly, nearly six foot tall, stronger than myself. If she wrestles me, she will knock me down. If she boxes me, she will knock me down. So I cannot touch her. <laughs> But she decided not to be humiliated by being uh, in this uh, camp, having this multiple rape every day. So she ran away escaped from the camp and now alhamdulillah she survived and she managed to organize an organization looking after the victims of the war especially the victims of rape at that time and support them doing the handicraft she was looking after her children and after her disabled uh, husband as well it's one of the classical cases of the victims of rape. So during the war in Bosnia at that time, nobody believed that human being called themselves human being would be able to do what the Chetnik from Serbia did to the Muslims in Bosnia. Chetniks, which are a terrorist group, from this Serbia. Not all the Serbs are bad. Some of them are extremely good, like all of you, maybe better, but the Chetnik are a different story. Or doing the ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing in Bosnia was not something done in 1992 to 1995. It was done after the Second World War in, uh, at a place called Drina River. Huge massacre. We used to throw the bodies And before that, every 40 and 50 years, actually, a massacre happened in Bosnia. Srebrenica was uh, an uh, ugly scar on the face of the United Nations. Ugly scar on the face of the United Nations. Because the United Nations peacekeeping forces, which from Holland, surrendered Srebrenica, which was one of the enclaves, to the Serb, thinking that the, the, the Chetnik, the Chetnik, I'm not calling them Serb, because Serb are, some of them are extremely good, uh, to the Chetnik, led by uh, Miladic and Karadic. One of them was the leader of Serbia, and the, the Serbs in Bosnia, the second one was the military leader. leader. And... Uh, At that time, this was 9, 10, and 11 of July 1995. The United Nations peacekeeping forces left Srebrenica, and the Chetnik forces came to the area, separated men from women, and put men in Srebrenica. Some of the men refused. I said that we are going to run to the wood and not to surrender to the Chetnik. Most of them were shot dead whilst trying to escape, whether they are young boys, actually, or men or elderly, whatever it is. Even the people amongst them who were actually in these big warehouses, which was the ex-UN peacekeeping forces, uh, uh, peacekeeping forces there were shot, all of them, as groups. So... Many, many narrations saying that we don't know how many people have been killed, but people say that more than 14,000 people disappeared. Up to now, what they discovered after 27 years of finding the remains of the body, they discovered less than 9,000 remains of young people. Last of them was 10, 11 of July of this month. So every year, United Nations discovering 
new remains of the bodies. For the Chetnik to cover their crime, they used to cut the bodies into smaller pieces and throw each piece to each place. So you found the same body, remain of the same body, in five or six or seven or eight places. And this is not different to the Holocaust, which happened to our Jewish brothers and sisters in the Second World War. So Srebrenica massacre is not just a massacre, it's another Holocaust. Not the Holocaust, actually before that, it was the organized mass, the government organized mass rape to the young girls, systematically. Then the Srebrenica massacre, which was actually 9, 11 of July 1995. So why we are talking about Srebrenica today? Because we don't want it to happen to any other nation, to any other race, to any other group, to any other religious people. Enough is enough. We don't want those extremist, radical, terrorist group to stand up and covering themselves with religion or religious belief or religious dogma and say, this is our church, this is our synagogue, this is our mosque. No. Neither the church, nor the mosque, nor the synagogue, nor the temple will ask people to rape the young female victims or kill the innocent people actually in this area. This is the story. If you want to ask any more question about Srebrenica before going to Turkey, I'm ready for that. Telephone, microphone for you, sir. When you started your work in uh, Srebrenica, uh, what do you, do you, have you noticed now a change in attitude of people from then to now, in, within uh, 25 plus years? So the general public, not just talking about people within our own circles, but outside them and the general people, do they have a changed attitude to, the, to what happened there? Unfortunately, when I was there, not this time, uh, before COVID, when we met an elderly man who was looking after his farm, soon he remembered what happened in 1995. He broke down in tears and was on his feet and hands telling who's going to protect my children. I'm expecting this to happen again. To happen again to my grandchildren. How can we prevent it? People still carrying the agony of what happened before. People in this area still living on this what called hot plate, as if the, area, the whole area is like ala safih and sakhin, speak many languages. On a hot plate. On a hot plate, yani. expecting any conflict to happen any time. Like a volcano. On lack of volcano, which is going to erupt any time, unfortunately. This is what I felt when I went there to see Odessa with other colleague of mine, or when I was there before COVID, when we saw a handful of men still saying we are expecting any break out of conflict anytime, unfortunately. This is what the people is still, after 25 years, are still, do not believe in the sustainability of the fragile peace of Dayton Treaty in 1995. What we need, uh, Muslims and non-Muslim countries, to solidify the process of peace and to build a stronger Bosnia and to prevent any bloodshed to happen again, not only in Bosnia, but in the whole of Balkan, which is wider area than Bosnia. And your role as a humanitarian aid worker, uh, going to a place like that, obviously, in the they generally shouldn't have any political opinions and political views uh, in such uh, scenarios. So when you go and you're faced with such uh, things that go on and you're faced with uh, atrocities or oppression and things like that, how how do you keep yourself composed, or how does it, how would a humanitarian keep himself level-headed and not be swayed either way? Well. 
you have to make your objective very clear. When we visited Srebrenica for the first time after the massacre in 2000, 2000 to try to build houses and bring people back to the municipality, we went impartially to speak to the Serb, the Croat, and the Bosnian in the same area. So we are going to build these houses for any returnees, not only for the Muslims. This was in 2000. Then we had the funding from one of the Arab uh, uh, organization and who gave us about $500,000. So we had a partnership with another German organization to build about 450 to 500 houses, bring everybody back, nearly for 500 uh, families to come back. At the time when we spoke to the Serb, or not Chetnik, or to Croat, or to the Muslims, we're trying to build the community together. So transparency, neutrality, impartiality has to be there from the very first beginning of any work in this area. And obviously you've traveled to many countries uh, across the globe. You've seen many conflicts, you've seen many wars, you've seen many droughts and famines, different things humanitarian uh, catastrophes all across the world. What made Bosnia stand out? Because I feel like it, it's, it's, a, it's different for you compared to any other thing that's happened. Why, why Bosnia specifically? <coughs> Bosnia is a very specific country because most of the Muslim Ummah did not know anything about Bosnia. Let me tell you a story. <coughs> when I visited Bosnia for the second time, in 1992, in April, May 1992, I spoke to the Grand Sheikh of Bosnia, like the Mufti of Bosnia, to take him to introduce Bosnia to different Arab countries. This was in May 1992. We brought him to UK to introduce the issue of Bosnia to the Muslims in UK. They didn't know anything about Bosnia despite the fact they are living in Europe. Then we went from here, there to Doha, Qatar. We met the late Amir, Rahmatullah and the Minister of uh, uh, foreign, uh, foreign Office Ministry. And most of the people did not know anything about Bosnia. Okay? Then we went from there to Bahrain. We met the late Sheikh, Rahmatullah with the Minister of Awqaf, most of the people also in Bahrain did not know anything about Bosnia or the people of Bosnia. Then went from there to Emirate, the same thing again. Then went to Kuwait and were hosted by the Crown Prince, Sheikh Saad al Abdullah. Most of the politicians in this area or even the workers in this area did not know anything about Bosnia or the Muslims in the, in the middle of Europe. Maybe Turkey knows because the, the historical relationship between Turkey as Ottoman and this area. Then we went to Egypt. It would be the last stop, stop in Egypt. At the, a guest of the Grand Sheikh of Al Azhar. Most of them, in Egypt they knew because there's a lot of students from Bosnia and from Balkan are studying there. And there was marriages between Egyptian and Bosnian woman. They called them Bosniak at that time. So, but most of the Arabs did not know anything about Bosnia at that time. So our aim at that time is to read the Sheikh, the Grand Sheikh of uh, Bosnia, to introduce Bosnia as a, as, 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 a, as a country or as a place and the Bosnian to all the Arabs, politician or media or others. And this was actually our first step. After that, a lot of organizations, to be very honest, the credit should go to many organizations in 1992, 93, and 94 who came from Morocco, from Algeria, from Tunisia, from Sudan, from Egypt, from Yemen, uh, from even Syria, from Jordan, from Saudi Arabia, from Emirates, from Kuwait, from Bahrain, from Oman, uh, what else? 
from Indonesia, from Iran, from Pakistan, from Malaysia. All of them came, tried to support, and from Turkey, of course, and was the first one from Turkey, stronger than anyone else. So all of them came to support and to stop the influx of refugees and their terror displacement at that time. So these organizations, despite the fact they were young, don't have a lot of experience, but they managed to stop the bleeding of the Bosnian nation as a nation. You can ask any brother as well if he wants. Okay, I'll ask you, carry on. Um, as youth uh, in the West, how, what lessons do you think that, what lessons should we learn from, or should we take from uh, the events in Bosnia? in the 90s. Don't ever radicalize your religion. Don't ever make your religion to be supreme to others. Because yes, we are better than you. Say good things to the people. And with the, with the mercy of Allah, you became lenient to them. To them means Muslims and non-Muslims. And if you were stone-hearted and rough, they could not have followed you, Muhammad So when you are here, don't become arrogant and show that, yeah, they are whatever, and look down at them. No, take them by the hand. And take them by the, your manner. Make your manner to speak louder than the verses from the Quran. Because how Hazrat Aisha uh, described the Prophet, ﷺ, she used to say, Kana khulqur Quran, aw kana Quranan yamshi al ard. Hazrat Aisha used to say about Muhammad, ﷺ, he was, his manner was Quranic, or he was like a walking Quran. So, Prophet Muhammad, ﷺ, when he was in Mecca, he was trusted, loved, respected by his enemies. And they never said about him that he's a liar. Or saying, talking about language about somebody. Or backbiting. This should be the manner of us in the West and in the East. Even in the East, when you are, for instance, in Pakistan, or in Turkey, or in Algeria, or in Morocco, or in Egypt, don't look down a people who claim that they are Muslims, but they have different ideology. Like those people claim that they are socialist, communist, liberal, secularist. Okay, talk to them as friends, talk to them as brothers, talk to them as citizens of the country, talk to them as partners, that we need them to help in building the country. In our conference, in uh, our meeting, I don't like to call it conference because conference could be negative because quite often the conferences means nothing. Is that right? Many conferences mean nothing. One of the people who were invited was a secular and he was shocked to be invited, number one, because the top notch, uh, what do you call it, uh, mega, mega stars. You have seen the video, the, not, not my video, the, the names of the people. If I mention the names, you could not be able to, to believe that you're going to stand on the same platform with those people. To be accepted by mainstream Muslim. And he wrote a message to us, which you could not believe that somebody like him will write a message like this. But whether he is a secular or not, or a socialist or not, treat him with the manner of Islam, not with the manners of people. Because if, you, if somebody make you angry, don't become angry. And treat him with how the Prophet treated others where they made him angry. Okay, and this is how, when we are in the West, even don't make mockery to the young girls who are not wearing hijab. Or the young brothers are not growing beard. 
do, do not go to uh, make uh, prayer in the mosque. From Tunisia, there was somebody called, uh, oh, I can't remember the name, not Marzuki, not the head of Nahda, another one, the Sheikh in the first one. Moro, 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 Moro. Moro was a young man from Tabligh Jama'a. And he wanted to do da'wah to anybody. And he was in the main street, in the main street and found somebody like myself. And he invited me to the mosque. The man went with him. And he went to the mosque. And the imam, soon he saw Moru, Abu Fatah, and the man, he smelled the smell of alcohol from the man. He told him, Abu Fatah, how can you bring somebody who is drinking alcohol to the mosque? Please ask him to go home, have a shower, clean up, and come back. The man refused. Say, I'm going to pray with you, Isha or Maghrib, I can't remember. So the man was arguing with Abu Fatah. Abu Fatah was a young man like all of you. He said, no, I'm not going, I'm going to pray. So the imam said, okay, fine. If you pray, don't stand in the middle of the row. Stand to the last row at the side. So nobody will smell your bad smell. Okay? And they prayed, I think it was Asha. And the last rak'ah, everybody said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And the man was still making sujood. Wake up, wake up, the man is dead. So Allah invited such a man to die in his house huh? As in sujood. Another one at the time of Salim al-Awwal, Sultan Salim al-Awwal in Turkey. A man like you, and your, you know your father, was he keen to support Muslims? like your father. And this man was every night going out to the houses of prostitution. And everybody was cursing him. And his wife was telling him, please. And the people will not understand what you are doing. You know what he said? He used to tell him, the sultan, which is you, is your expensive coat here. The sultan and his ministers and his army will pray on my janazah. His wife was, oh my God, you're going every night. She knows that she's going every night to save money to give to the girls. The money so they don't, so they don't make zina. And going to buy some of the bottles of alcohol and throw it. But the public did not know that. One day, the man is dead. And he was in the middle of the road. And the Sultan was passing by in the evening. And nobody knew the Sultan. And they found this man, dead man, said, Why don't you bury him and pray for him? Everybody in the area said, This man was drinking alcohol and was, what they call it, going to this house every night without knowing what he was doing. So he said, okay, fine, let me go to his wife, the Sultan, Salim al Awwal. Uh, he went to his wife and told him, what's wrong with your husband? She told him the story. The story is that my husband used to save money, and every night he used to go and give the money to the girls to stop them from making zina, and to the people who are selling alcohol, stop them to buy the alcohol from them and uh, pour it in the drainage. And she told the Sultan, but he said what he said. The Sultan told him what? He said, he, she, he said to me that the one who is going to lead the prayer on me is the Sultan and his ministers and his army. The Sultan was in tears. She was telling him, why you cry? He told him, I am the Sultan and he is my minister and tomorrow I bring all the army and ministers to pray on this man. Don't judge people 
by the look. Be close to them to understand what they do. Because they may do, be doing a great job. Actually, you don't know how many people commit every night a sin. But when they go to, before they go to sleep, they will be crying because they cannot actually control themselves. Pray for them instead of cursing them. So now that I think that brings us on to your conference in Turkey, or your meeting in Turkey, inshallah, uh, and your trip, I think, how many days were you there? In Turkey, I was there for a week. A week. So how did you spend your week? And I saw on your Facebook, you went to many places, many lives, many meetings. Uh, how did that go? Okay. In Turkey, this was a dream. I, I consider Istanbul like the hub of the Muslim thinkers, especially Arabs, or the Muslim theologians, especially Arabs, the Muslim uh, philosophers, especially Arabs, because it, I'm not talking about the Turk as Turkish. I'm talking actually the five or six million who came after the Arab Spring, and most of them came from the Arab area, and they're actually, especially live, most of them live in Istanbul. Our dream at that time, every time I used to come from a, a long trip, I used to organize with one of the local organizations a workshop, traditional workshop about capacity building, about communication networking, about uh, programs, about management, about finance and others. But this is known by everybody. Human relief, human appeal, Islamic relief, Muslim hand, Muslim aid, everybody knows that. This time I told the brothers, my brothers in Istanbul, one of the Yemeni organization, it's called the Wukala al Yemeniya, the Tanmiya wal Agatha, the Yemeni Agency for Relief and Development, said, Enough is enough. We used to do this, but now let us do something new. He said, What's new? We want to fundraise. He said, Forget about the money. The money is not everything. He said, What do you want us to do? We discussed the issue, me and them and said, let us look at the different dimensions of humanitarian work. I said, what do you mean? Different dimensions, what do you mean? Different dimension means the culture, the values, the manners, the history, the diplomacies, the impact of media, the impact of politics, the impact of economics, actually, and others on humanitarian work. Let me take you by the hand for a story in Surat Al-Kahf of somebody called, what's his name? Zulqarnay. Zulqarnay. He's your uncle? <laughs> He's from, your, from Pakistan or from Turkey? Zulqarnay put the classical rules of intervention by any superpower to any local uh, community. He went to the far west, then to the far east, then to those people who could not be able to speak properly. And they asked him to build a wall between them and Gug and Magug. Because Gug and Magug come every year, rape the girls, take them, take the animals, burn the crops, and do all these sort of things. You know what Dirkanen did? Exactly what so-called international agencies are doing nowadays. But Dulkarnin did it a long time ago. First of all, protection by his army to stop Gug and Magug coming. Second thing, engaged with the local community to find needs assessment, to assess the needs. Then he discovered the local resources. Atuni Zubar al-Hadid. Then he engaged them, trained them to cut the pieces of iron, burn it. So this means training them. Then he, he, he burned the iron between the two mountains. Then he made another alloy out of cover. That means that he transferred the technology, which was not found in this area. Okay, then he built the wall. Then he left without having any reward. These were the principles 
of the dimension of global intervention in any local community as a request of the local community. Nowadays, any superpower or any multinational companies, they go to steal the resources. They go to empower local armed groups, actually, to give them the raw materials, whether it's in DRC, Democratic Republic of Hong Kong, or in any African country. And look at what some of the superpowers who are members of the, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Security Council, doing in Africa, especially West Africa, in Mali, in Niger, in Chad, Central Republic of Africa, and others. This was actually the mention. We wanted to take the, 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 the principles or the theory of the Rukhanian to this meeting. This meeting, we said, we are going to discuss things which have not been discussed by other organizations before. Because it does not bring money. If you talk about research, studies, it does not bring money. If you talk about uh, philosophy, it does not bring money. Right? But these are essential for the organization to grow and surprise itself. So Alhamdulillah, with the grace of Allah, we had about 28 speakers. All of them speak, spoke on the speciality with the same objective. To actually meet in the middle and put a new dimension. What we said at that time, brothers, is نحن نؤذن لعصر جديد. We are making a plan for a new era where we should be coming the leaders of the international humanitarian work. Enough is enough to be followers. Because we have been following others respectively, respectively for 40 years, or 50 years, or 60 years. Now, we have to become leaders. Okay? If we could be able to become leaders, at least to become the co- and most effective leaders which is you, because you have the values, you have the moralities, you have the philosophy, you have the ideology, you have the history, you have the ability to do that. And alhamdulillah, it went very successfully. You know who was behind the success? Of course, Allah is number one. People at your age and younger, 17 of them, were dedicated, working hard to take the minutes, and to make the Zoom meetings and make the communication with others. It's not only the mega stars, but young people like you who believe that they can make this event very successful for three days. And you know the cost? You might say that three days, you invite all those people, but be talking about hundred to hundred thousand dollars. Is that right? Yes, 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 less than twenty five thousand dollars. Less than $25,000. But the mega star came because each one of them had the message to deliver, had the mission to accomplish, had the aim and the objective to achieve, and has a role to play, male and female. And as I told you before, some of them were from different backgrounds. Some of the girls were not hijabi. Some of the men were not Islamic-minded. They were secular or socialist. So what? We take the man or the woman because they have the value for the community, with the value for us. That's what happened in Turkey between 26 and 28th of July. So uh, with the youth, that were, how many youth were present there? Or how many people were, uh, attended the conference? At the conference in the, in the main hall was about 70 to 80 people. Organization, heads of organizations. The youth behind the success story was 17. 17. And most of them were female. Even the, like the, the MC of the conference was a young girl at the age of 24, 25. She could not believe that she would become the MC. And she is introducing super or mega, mega mega stars and she's one from the people who came from syria the rest as well from syria 
from Morocco, oh, one, one, the one who made the Zoom to North Africa and West Africa and other countries was from Morocco. One of these actually platforms. May Allah bless him, brother uh, Hamad al Akhdar. Okay, from one of the organizations there. Okay, and also from another uh, platform called Rawad from Syria. Some people travel from Lebanon, from Jordan, from Morocco, okay, to come to attend, from London to come to attend, from Germany to come to attend uh, as well. So, but the youth behind the door, which is the unsung hero, were actually uh, 17 plus, and most of them were young girls. How do you think in the UK for NGOs or charitable organizations, how could we reflect that same image here in the UK? Because what you've described in Turkey is something that's, you know, it's different and it's more forward thinking. In the UK, we, it's rare that we'd find something like that, yeah. especially with our own organizations and people that we have here. Unfortunately, in UK, we became red herring or hair splitting, is it? So how about the bold people? How about the bold people who don't have hair? <laughs> like myself. You see, Diyubandi, Tablighi, Salafi, Sufi, all this waste of time. The success story in Turkey was because we did not bought a divisive logo to bring those people together. Unfortunately, in Turkey now, and sorry, in, in the UK now, in spite of the fact that we have got more freedom than Turkey, more resources than Turkey, but we don't have the wisdom. If we do this, it has to be Salafi. It has to be Jamaat Islami. It has to be Tablighi. It has to be Diyubandi. It has to be Sufi. And which is Sufi? Okay? It has to be secular. It has to be whatever it is. This is wrong. When we discuss this issue in Istanbul with young people at your age and older, I asked them, one of the young people, why those people came? They said, I don't know. Maybe because you are, some of them are friends. I said, it's not enough. They came because there was no logo to offend. There was no logo to dictate. There was no somebody pushing people to say what the, his organization wanted them to say. Each one of them was giving a topic and sometimes they changed their own topic. Said, no, we don't want to talk about this. Let me talk about what I want to speak. Speak what you want to say. Want to say what you want to say. Even from IHH, which is IHA in Istanbul, they are the only organization amongst the Muslims and the Arabs who is talking about humanitarian diplomacy. You know what they mean by humanitarian diplomacy? To go and release the prisoners of war, the hostages. They managed to, to release a lot of Syrian, and from Philippines, and even from Libya. Actually, like the International Committee of Red Cross. They are doing it successfully. This something has to go to be at the back of the mind of the people who are running the organization and the sign of maturity. So once you remove the logo and you put small organ and all the organization, four or five of them, very small ones, very small ones, not the mega Muslim charity, like your organization or other organization. So there was no, there was no dictation from the organizers on the speakers. And the speakers spoke the language they want to say, and they said what they want to say. But subhanAllah, all of them said the same thing, differently to the same objective. In conclusion of this, you know what they said? We need to start making and putting our own definitions. Making and putting our own definitions. Fine. Thank you very much for your definition of impartiality or neutrality or accountability. Let me add onto it. I'm going to recognize what you said. Okay? Fine. But my culture, my value, 
my belief, huh? my philosophy will let me add something else. Let me tell you an example which I made uh, a few days ago. What do you mean by humanitarian response? Humanitarian response now means, you want to, to define humanitarian response? No, no, say, say what, what they told you. Uh, so what we know in our tribe sector, humanitarian response is straight away we'll gather funds and uh, respond back to an emergency that's happened. And that's it, either with food, money, that's it. <laughs> Give him a kiss. For me, humanitarian response, an istigabal insaniya, ya sharaka, wukdaniya, wukudiya, an maddiya, u maddiya. Ma'anah eh? First of all, it's a partnership. The foundation of the humanitarian response is a partnership. Wukdaniya means feeling. From Rujdan. You have to feel the agony of the people of Afghanistan, the people of Ukraine, the people of Palestine, the people of Gaza, and all those people. Wukdaniya. Wujudiya existential or existential. It's all the time with you. Because it becomes your responsibility to respond. Not only to Gaza, but to any other country. Then Madea, which is financial, is the last one. But the beginning is partnership. The last, financial. Now we talked about financial only. But you didn't tell me about partnership, about feeling, and about existential. It's more important, or as important as the financial. So, with a foundation like this, of the partnership, the three pillars coming from it, is emotional, existential, and financial. On the basis of equal partnership between us and you. You are coming from Europe with the money. That does not mean that you are better than myself. When you come to me to give me the money that you raised for me, we are equal. And this is the partnership. This is the definition. And the others that we need to add our own definition. Our own definition. Uh, actually, it's very important. You mentioned the definition. Oh, uh, now we've become excited, huh? Yeah, because you, you mentioned the definition specifically. Because for my research recently, I um, one of the case studies I'm doing is about Geneva Call. I don't know if you heard of Geneva Call. Recently made a new definition about armed non-state actors because they found that calling them armed non-state actors automatically puts puts you out of uh, neutrality like you're no longer neutral because some groups see themselves as a, uh, a new state some some groups see themselves differently so just by defining them in a certain way you're you're already um losing out on a lot that you can do with neutrality yes and impartiality. yes so they've recently added new definitions of how to refer to these groups. How uh, to redefine what they defined before. Yes, yes. Or right. review what they defined before. Yes, yes. Sorry. But once you say to me, I tell you something, terrorism, up till now, up till now, nobody has agreed on universal definition of terrorism. 180 countries, to member state of the United Nations, are fighting terrorism, but none of them agree, or all of them did not agree on what is the definition of terrorism. How on earth you fight an enemy which you don't know its definition? Okay? Once you call me, or you call somebody else, an, a non-state armed group, that may be I'm on this side, of, of, of the group could be extremist, could be become radical, could become but those people are defending the community. There's nothing called defending community anymore. If you hold an arm in your hand to defend somebody coming to rape your sister, your mother, your daughter, you could be considered a terrorist or you could be considered a radical. Or extremists, what do you want me to do? When you sit down at home 
and see somebody coming to rape my, 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 my sister, my wife, and my daughter, to kill my children and steal my wealth and sit down to become impartial or neutral? What is this? So this kind of lack of deep definitions or more comprehensive definition, which need to be revisited again and again and again. And the problem with us, brothers, is we don't invest money from our organization on research studies. I come out with a new definition, come out with a new philosophy, come out with a new ideology, come out with a new culture, come out to write the history of how, you know, if, 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 if I look at the last 50 years from the 70s, tell me, and I'm challenging you and myself, and you as well, from Morocco, whoever, which organization wrote the history from its inception to up to date, most of the founders are dead. Who's going to write the story? Nobody. How your children or my children will know the great achievement has been done by you in the dark ages when there was no resources, no internet, no computer, no telephone, just walking on foot. Just walking from a village to a village. No communication. No communication at all. But those people were achieving great achievement. How the younger generation will know that? If you don't invest in writing the history, in research, how are you going to change the definitions? If you don't invest in research and get some fund for researchers to get your new definition. And this is the challenge. Humanitarian work is not only fundraising. Fundraising is an important element. But you have to know how can you become not fundraising, philosophy raising, ideology raising, culture raising, history raising, um, manner raising, and all these kind of things? You want to come back to me? I'm exciting you as Algerian to head back. <laughs> no, I just uh, you covered the main things. I think just uh, also. Um, I think was very important to highlight is, um, uh, for example, Professor Wiramantri is an international law. Uh, he was uh, part of the. Uh, I forgot exactly, but Professor Wiramantri is an international law lawyer, and he argues that specifically he argues for all uh, the globe, but specifically for Islam that. Islam has many concepts in international law that uh, that can be incorporated into contemporary international law to help with the current situation because a lot of the uh, you know international laws and um, a lot of the organizations just focus on contemporary approaches but there's solutions to current because each region has their own culture their own way of doing things and it's very important to understand the culture there, the history, and how it can be developed. The concept can be developed to deal with current challenges. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. You see, coming back to what you said, you know what's the problem, Brother Mikhail, and everybody in the room? It is we are defeatist. Sometimes don't say, don't mention ayah. Don't mention uh, what you call it, hadith. Don't mention a story, incident happened at the good time of whether the Ottoman or the Andalusian or the Umayyad or the Abbasi or, 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 where most of the Orientalists used to come to this area from the first Hijri century, which is the 6th or 7th uh, century, up till the 15th, 16th centuries or 19th centuries to extract the information from this area. Proudly referring to Islam, referring to Hadith, referring to the philosophy, referring to the culture, referring to the morality, referring to all this. But the defeatists are the Muslims who do not want to shine themselves by standing next to a say of the Prophet mm -hmm. or a translation from the ayah. 
I give you an example which I don't want to make it personal. When I was doing my doctor of medicine, I, I used to be a doctor. You remember? Yeah. Cut the bodies. <laughs> Bismillah, mashallah. This is a nice one. <laughs> you deserve my hand and my knife. <laughs> yes? Can I try? <laughs> After the talk. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. And uh, I did a very bad, uh, stupid mistakes. Grammatically, I haven't even uh, putting wrong references. Of course, they are fatal. So I had two examples. One of them was a surgeon. The second one was pathologist. The surgeon said, I am Humar. Humar means donkey. The second one said, he is a pioneer. Because the second one was a pathologist. Because I was focusing on something never done before. But I was working like Humar. Alhamdulillah. At your age, you have to go through al humuriya stage. The humoria stage is for you. And for you, and for you. Work like humar, like donkey. Or gada. Yeah. gada. <laughs> and, uh, but the second one, I was saved, alhamdulillah, by the second one. Because he was a pathologist. So the head of the pathology department of the medical school in Birmingham University, which is Queen Elizabeth, brought me to sit down with him and the head of the department as well as an external professor. And they told me, honey, said, yes, sir. He was the head of the, of the Royal College of Pathologists as well. He said, honey, and he did I want your thesis in our library. You have to pass. Because he listened to the pathologist, to the specialist. And the specialist told them what maybe Muhammad or Mikhail did something that never been done before. When I sat down with the professor that he came to correct my language and the references, I was, uh, my beard was not as long as your beard, but it was يعني, between. I was like actually <laughs> at the time, the, the, the zealous time, okay? He told me, I bought three pages from the Quran as gratitude. As what? Gratitude is one paragraph, one line, on one word. To my wife, to my dog, to my neighbor, to my boss, whatever it is. But I bought three pages of Quran. Was me or was Dr. Ahmad Isa? Remember Ahmad Isa? The one who gave khutbah. He was doing his master in audiology. I was doing my doctor of medicine in pathology. And Dr. Ahmad. And he chronologically put all the ayah and gave it to me. I said, three pages. He said, this is the creation of man. And the professor who came to correct my language said, honey, what is all this Quran? Three pages. You know with, with how did I look like at that time? I said, sir, isn't it scientific knowledge or not? I shut him up. I said, yes, it is scientific knowledge. Second question from me, do you want me to remove it or leave it? He said, no, leave it. Alas, if you talk about scientific knowledge, which is a part of your discussion, why you remove it? You know, the good thing about it is, at the bottom of the three pages, I said, Allah, as the author, from this year to this year, and Quran, no publisher. Go and find it. In a very arrogant way. This where you be very proud as a young man. You know who was the first man? I just keep saying it again and again and again. I like his body. Huh? <laughs> On a tray, you can... I'm <laughs> good. And uh, the first man who discovered was from, uh, from Andalusia, who discovered spina bifida, the children was split in the bone and sac or water in the brain. 
or with no brain, was his name was uh, Abu Qasim al Zahrawi from Al Zahra next to Qurtuba. This was 10th century, five centuries before Europe. We discovered this because his name in, in Latin was Bukasas. So we have to change actually the name from Bukasas to Abu Qasim al Zahrawi. And here, for you, Brother Muhammad or Mahmoud or Ali or Sumayya or others, you have to be extremely proud of what Allah revealed hundreds of years ago or 1400 years ago before anybody else. Science and technology in the Quran. This, uh, what's his name, James Webb. You know James Webb Telescope? Yeah. Is James Webb? The one that just yeah, yeah, listen. Me. It is something you deserve to discover because all what he saw through this telescope is what Allah written or revealed in the Quran. The cycle of the moon, the sun, the star, the universe, the galaxies and everything. Because we consider that we are the Ummah of Iqra is the Ummah of literacy, not the Ummah of knowledge. Sir, back to you. Because you are the master of ceremony. You have any more questions? Any question? Any question, any question from Turkey? Any question maybe about uh, Turkish politicians, about uh, Islamic, Islamic view or politics? Uh, okay. Sir, uh, I wonder about your opinion about uh, current politicians and government of Turkey within the Islamic view and issues. And do you think they matters politics and economics profits more than Islamic? For, Can you explain more? Uh, for current politicians, governments and organizations, do you think their currently matters the politics or financial issues or Islamic matters? I see. I see. Yeah, okay. this problem. Thank you. The problem nowadays, brother, or what's your name? Yes, sir. Huh? Mas'ud, Mas'ud. Brother Mas'ud. The problem is now, uh, Turkey is in the middle of the universe. Anything happening in the universe will affect Turkey. It's not like the good old days. We're separated. We can build our economy in separation from the economy of the Persian, or the economy of the Roman, or the economy of the Egyptian. Nowadays, the economy is interconnected. The power of the dollar is impacting the economy of Turkey. The power of the dollar is impacting the economy of Russia. That's why Russia recently started to charge people with rubble, especially when they get the gas and the oil from, uh, from Russia after the Ukraine war. So no matter how strong your country is, you will be definitely affected negatively or positively by the global economy and the global politics. So you have to be very careful of doing that. So no matter how good your belief in Islam, it's not good enough nowadays, unless you have a coalition of other countries. If there is a handful, like actually European Union, or like the G7, or the G20, standing up together, they can defend each one of them. But if one country was only standing by itself, it will not be able to defend itself theologically, morally, actually, because there's nobody else can help her. And this was happening to a country like Turkey, on one side, a country like Iran. What we should, what we should have seen, unfortunately, which was not happening, some of the Muslim countries should be around Turkey or around Iran to try to strengthen the countries, strengthen the ideology of Islam, so we can protect the economy as well. But if you leave Turkey alone, of course, Turkey will definitely, no matter how strong it is, it will be impacted by the global politics and the global, actually, economy as well as the local opposition. Because the local opposition could be 
different ideology or different interests and the regional enemies because some regional enemies do not like democracy to come to any Middle Eastern countries, unfortunately. And some of those uh, uh, people or countries are in the area of the Middle East. They don't, because if they see this country become democratic and strong and standing up, this will affect their actually democracy, which is no democracy in their countries. This is actually how we became affected. Actually, you see, Algeria is affected by what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Turkey, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in Africa. What is that to do with Because now we are actually living in a global village or a very big or king-sized bedroom where everybody is inside one room. So if you sneeze with flu, I will get it. Some good old says will say that if the American sneeze in Washington DC or Los Angeles, actually the flu will affect China because we became one global village. So you cannot actually, uh, unless you, as I said, unless you have a coalition of a five or 10 or 15 strong countries believing in the same Islamic theology, you will not be able to protect yourself by yourself. And that's what unfortunately happened to certain countries who are actually strong, but now they have to give in. Back to you, sir. The only one who did not speak is the Andalusian brother. <laughs> you want to say anything about it? Okay, no problem. Okay, you want to say something? Uh, so you can call, uh, uh, end by recitation for us. And uh, as, as long as you want. Sure. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها المزمن قم الليل إلا قليلا نصفه أو ينقص منه قليلا أو زد عليه ورتل القرآن ترتيلا إنا سنلقي عليك قولا ثقيلا إن ناشئة الليل هي أشد وطأ وأقوى مقيلا إن لك في النهار سبحا طويلا واذكر اسم ربك وتبتل إليه تبتيلا رب المشر رق والمغرب لا إله إلا هو لا إله إلا هو فاتخذه وكيلا لا إله إلا 
أخرك الذي أنقض ظهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك فإن مع العسر يسرا إن مع العسر يسرا فإن مع العسر يسرا إن مع العسر يسرا فإذا فرغت فانصب وإلى ربك فارغب صدق الله العظيم Inshallah, I bark Allah fiqh and we thank you all for listening and inshallah I hope we hope to see you all soon inshallah and we pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to continue to do more and more good work for the ummah and for the nation and for the whole world inshallah Amin ya rabbal alameen السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته